So I think we should uh, first of all do a very big welcome, Jack Dunning, Untold. Thank you. So I think it's kind of appropriate with you to play something new, seeing as you're someone that always, you know, likes to push things forward. Yeah. Um, there's a track called Doff that you played last night, which has kind of got this scatter fire drums and you playing guitar on it. Um, yeah, I think this is my first uh, record that I, that's got me playing uh, guitar. So I'm sorry about that. I'm also very sorry if anyone's hung over because uh, it's a bit of an onslaught, this one. But, You're about um, to be brutalized. But let's kick it off. So is this going to be a new Hemlock or a new, new label thing? This, I think this is going to be an offshoot of Hemlock. Um, so it will just be like on a black label uh, with another sort of drum track on the other side. That's the plan for next year. Is to, we've been quite slow with releases. We've been like, choosing everyone for Hemlock very, um, very carefully. And I think the plan for next year is to try and get as many bits of vinyl out as possible um, for club play. Um, I don't know if people have noticed, but there's not as much vinyl coming out now, and I think it's a shame. So that's the plan with this track. Get it out, get it in the clubs. <laughs> okay, speed things up a little bit. Is there like a construction sort of vibe? Yeah, I mean, this. I'm really, really inspired by Jam City. I mean, uh, his drum work, I think, is, is insane. It's next level, and, you know, I'm always really aware for kind of biting people and, uh, you know like you know trying to take someone's star but for me drum like drum onslaughts is exciting that's the sort of thing that i want to go dancing to in clubs um so yeah so out to jam city <laughs> so if you were talking about yeah if you were talking about a kind of aesthetic that you're really feeling at the moment would it be rawness would it be sparseness or would it just be the kind of onslaught that you've just mentioned i mean i just when i go to a club now i just want to be melted you know i'm just so sick of uh, just conservative music within boundaries, you know? It's like uh, there's, there's not enough people. I'm not hearing wild enough stuff, you know? I mean, maybe I'm not going to the right places, you know, you, <laughs> you tell me where to go that it's happening, but that's what I want to dance to, you know? It's like not, not simple fall to the floor stuff. That's great, you know? It's an, you know, it's an industry, but uh, I come from dubstep before that, I was into drum and bass, so my I associate going out and listening to music with having my mind blown. So that's <laughs> I'm trying to blow people's minds. And I guess also not just have kind of having that feeling, but also that progression and that sense of of speed of records being made on the fly, of people responding to what was played last night, yeah. what will be played tomorrow, and trying to best that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. 
So you mentioned there's not as much vinyl coming out, but you've been buying a lot more records recently, haven't you? Um, last year, I totally switched things up. Um, I had a bit of digital malaise, maybe. Um, you know, I was getting sent, you know, sent promos like lots of DJs do, and it's like a, a long list of emails of music to check, and you check through it and check through it. And it's like I actually forgot that I used to go and buy records. You know, um, so I unsubscribed from every list, and uh, I just went out record shopping. You know, you know, order it off the online or whatever. But I just rediscovered my inner uh, record buyer, and uh, I think my sets are better for it. You know, it's like I guess it's one very quick way of making sure you've got different records from everybody else. Then, and also, I suppose like the act of listening to music. If you're listening to promos at home, like you might be sitting in the kitchen or in your bedroom or wherever. If you're out buying records, you've had to go maybe uptown. I don't know if you're like a Soho record shopper, um, yeah. but you, you have to make an effort and you're actually in a, uh, a complete, you're in a music environment, aren't you, when you're listening to records in a record shop? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just, uh, it's become more personal. So, um, you know, rather than just playing a file, um, you know, I play off USB sticks. So I don't carry around vinyl with me, um, I'm afraid, but each of them is ripped from the piece of vinyl at home. I, I then archive that. But um, I feel as though everything I'm playing is my record now. You know, it's uh, it's it's I own it, and I've got that relationship back with the music. It's not just playing, you know, the the latest thing that I got sent. So for me, it's just been really refreshing. I think uh, we've got a lot of music we want to play today. Uh, Jack's kindly sort of selected a load of music that tells a story, interesting records that come out at an interesting time, or records that is something to talk about. So I think we should kind of go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning. Yeah. What's the, um, where shall we start? We've got a uh, test signal, haven't we? The final track on the Kingdom 12 inch. Yeah, so a this, beginning for you. yeah, so this came out, I think, late 2007, 2008. It was my first release on Hessel Audio. Uh, and um, yeah, for me, yeah, this, this is, this is strange because I, uh, uh, I, a friend of mine I went to university with is a, um, a producer called Milanez. He was on Warp Records. Um, I sent him this track. I mean, I've been making, we'll maybe talk about it later, but I've been producing for a long time. But my first release um, was 2007. And uh, I sent this to Milanez uh, the day it was finished. That day, he sent it to Marianne Hobbs. And then that afternoon, I have uh, an email fr fr from Marianne. She says, I love Test Signal, it's going to be on Radio 1 tonight. So, like, to me, that's when my music career started. We should hear it. Oh, sorry.
So how much of that record came from time spent on the dance floor at a certain nightclub called DMZ? Um, yeah, I think I think Mal has got quite a lot to do with uh, with that record. Um, I mean, uh, for people that don't know, I mean, DMZ, uh, it's, uh, it's in a church in Brixton in South London, and... Uh, it's uh, the like the dub. It's where dubstep not started, but it's where dubstep happened. Uh, so, yeah, that was a result of coming back from there and rediscovering bass. You know, it was uh, the sound system was incredible. It's like uh, the physicality of being in that room. It was always rammed. You know, there was queues around the block. But you know, you, you, once you got in, it was so physical. And uh, I guess that was what I was trying to aim for. You know. Um, with the sub bass in that is that physicality and just being blasted with something so uh but how did you go from being one of the people that was there each and every time to someone who was actually turning that experience into something creative and making something contributing um well we've mentioned dmz i mean another important uh you know pillar of dubstep is uh, and and many other genres it, it's ford so it was uh, a regular thursday night in uh, plastic people and um it was for it, pretty much anyone who was making um underground bass music in london was there every week it's where i met uh, the hessel audio guys uh and it was just a wonderful uh you know every week there would be uh you'd hear a track and then uh, you go the next week and you hear a track that almost clashes that one. You could tell that there was a dialogue going on week by week uh, with the sound and it seemed to be evolving so quickly. And in, you know, there's so many uh, aspects that uh, were, it was in this framework. You know, there seemed to be an open palette that you could do, no rules. So, um, you know, that was uh, just chatting to people in the bar in, in, in Plastic People. Uh, swapping music, you know. But that wasn't the first time, was it, that you'd been there at the birth of something, you know. I mean, some of you may have been lucky enough to have been there when something started, and if you've ever been there when something started, you will always recognise it again, because it's a, a kind of, obviously, a very amazing thing, but also a, a, a profound thing. But can you tell us about uh, your sort of, like, early to mid-90s junglist experience? Um, well, yeah, I mean... Uh you know, I'm 37 now, so I, I'm lucky enough to kind of have been uh, at school kind of 14, 15 when, you know, in Jungle's golden era. And I guess I started the first time I heard dance music. You know, I was into bands and doing bad Nirvana covers um, with my uh, with my uh, college rock band. And uh, a friend gave me... Uh, a, a cassette tape uh, for, for my Walkman uh, with the bass boost, very important. Uh, and uh, on one side of the tape it said hardcore, uh, the other side it said more. And I don't know what it was, maybe I think it was a, a record, it must have been a, like a recording of a tape pack of uh, Dreamscape maybe or, or something. But um, yeah, I mean, I was hooked. So that was my experience as either through swapping tapes or uh, listening to pirate radio. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, eventually I managed to sneak in, to start sneaking into clubs, you know, the tail end of 94, 95, where already, you know, the, the music was changing so rapidly. But to experience that, um, as soon as I went to the DMZ club, uh, it's the same feeling, you know, it was the same feeling of just being blown away. So I'm, I feel very privileged to kind of, you know, be around. It's a shame, really, that there aren't more sympathetic bouncers around these days because there was a point maybe sort of in the era when we were going out where, like, a little bit of fake ID would get you into a club and the bouncer would be like, you're blatantly 16, but you obviously really want to be here, so come on in. Uh, it's, yeah. uh, I think it's, it's, it's a shame. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but also, you did... Um, you were saying to me as well that you kind of uh, was involved with the sound system with your friends as well, where you were inflicting some of your music tastes on an audience you maybe weren't quite so into it to start with. Yeah, so maybe uh, a little bit later, 96 or 97, uh, I, me and my friends got some money together, got some, I don't know how we found the plans, but we, we, we found some pl blueprints to, uh, to build a sound system. We, we built a very small, uh, modest rig, uh, bought a van and went out and did free parties. Uh, all my friends at the time and the people that were DJing for the main part were playing 
uh, fairly awful acid techno. Um, to it's a dog on a string era. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the crusty kind of dog on a string, uh, uh, you know, mess, messy time. Uh, and I was the guy that um, came on at sunrise and uh, played jungle to people that didn't want to hear it, apart from the guys that, you know, there was like sometimes there was a crew that would sort of, they would dry, you know, it was like, uh, it, we used to do it in Sussex around Brighton, sometimes on uh, an area area called the Ridgeway. So all really, really beautiful countryside. Um, so, so just great to be playing kind of drum and bass, you know, to a, to a sunrise. Um, yeah, but uh, I wasn't the most popular DJ. <laughs> What was your sound called? Uh, I think I was, yeah, I was DJ Magna then. <laughs> and did the sound, did the whole sound have a name? Like what was your it was crooning? It was called sabbatical sound. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so back to some music. Uh, we're going to go to another Hessel release, aren't we, Anaconda? Um, yeah, so this is, uh, was my second... So, so test signal that we heard before that was on uh, Hessel Audio number three, uh, and and this one was Hessel Audio um, number eight. I mean, I remember uh, Ben UFO really twisting my arm to try and release this track because I didn't like it when I wrote it. I wrote it, I think at the time I was feeling a little. It was when there was templates starting to come into dubstep music. Um, and you know what? What excited me before it was uh, with dubstep is there really was no template. You know, there seemed to be no rules. It's just bass, 140 BPM, do what you like. So I guess this was me uh, thrashing out a bit against the half step time, the sort of uh, drum beat that started to become more and more popular. Um, so yeah, so uh, here it is. Can hear the animal animal sounds in that. I think there's one sample CD called uh, Animal Tracks, and it's like not it's for like Hollywood films or something. That's like nine hours worth of jungle sounds and pigs having sex. <laughs> and, uh, it was uh, well rinsed in that track. <laughs> Do you think at this point you were starting to understand what your sound was, or or maybe what your sound could be? I just remember. I mean, it was just such a laugh, you know. Like we were just. Uh, you know, going to forward each week, and um, you know, I, I just, I was just having loads of fun, and you know, I think you can tell in that in that track, you know, it's not, you know, it's not meant to be a serious track, you know. I mean, it can, uh, I think, music can be powerful, but not necessarily have to be like po-faced and serious. So that was, yeah, just enjoying, enjoying making music and being part of a scene, and yeah. 
So should we move on to a point where you've already started your label, your five releases down, and well, this is your fifth release. Stop what you're doing. I, I mean, don't stop what you're doing. Play, stop what you're doing. <laughs> Yes, so this uh, is was from uh, Hemlock uh, number five, which was uh, a double vinyl pack I did. Uh, and this track was as a result of going, I think it was Brackles that was uh, playing at forward and he played an eight bar sub low grime set. Um, so for people that don't know, it's like uh, it's instrumental grime um, and it has uh, if, you know, very stripped back, very raw, um, but it has uh, like a really almost metallic uh, cold sound in the bass and all these bass labs. Uh, and, you know, I I was into drum and bass. Um, I kind of miss grime and garage. So, you know, I did a lot of learning retrospectively by going going kind of seeing Brackles, uh, you know, who, who's got all the white labels of, from, from that era uh, playing and... Uh, I was blown away, so uh, I went back and kind of, uh, this is what came out. start there I think there was a little bit of pigs having sex from that same sample CD just at the drum. You said you hadn't heard that version for 
quite a while. Yeah, that's the first time. Yeah, first time in about five years I've heard that. So it's interesting. We we can't really talk about that record without talking about the James Blake uh, remix. You said when we were chatting earlier that you just kind of had this casual conversation with him. How did it go? Um, well, actually, yeah, it was. Uh, it just turned up in the mail. Um, so that was Hemlock release number five. Number four was uh, James Blake's uh, debut, uh, Air and Lack Thereof. Um, so we'd, uh, he was actually the first artist uh, for the label that we'd approached uh, cold, if you like, you know, via, via email. And, uh, uh, you know, we, I think we heard it on a, it was a radio show on uh, Rinse FM maybe, we heard Air and Lack Thereof. Uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, it was like well, you know, we have to have to sign this. Let's 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 find out what what's going. And uh, so we just uh, we we put that out. And uh, so we were beginning our relationship with James. And uh, uh, I sent him uh, an early version of this. And uh, you know, three days later, he comes back with a remix. he said in the email said oh yeah I just really like the melody so I, you know <laughs> he said oh yeah I think it was quite persistent the melody so yeah, I've done some bits over it it's like yeah okay James we have to put this out now you realize <laughs> there's quite a f few more records that we need to talk about so I think we should move on and uh, take ourselves to the point where RNS records restarted which was a big moment for anyone that had loved those original techno records. Um, yeah, I mean, that was... Um, so this is a track called Stereo Freeze. Um, it came out on RNS in 2009, 2010, maybe. Um, it was... Um, so, yeah, I mean, RNS Records, obviously a legendary label, but it uh, lay dormant, maybe, for, I don't know... Um, 10 years or, or, or something like that and it was rebooted and you know I was really really lucky just to be asked to write something um, you know we mentioned before my background is uh, is drum and bass you know I <laughs> I don't know anything about techno <laughs> uh, all I know is like the classic Aphex Twin releases on RNS and just what a legendary uh, kind of legacy it has so it was the first track that I, I wrote, that's you know, that is the first track that someone asked me to write for. So it was quite daunting. But I guess what I was trying to do with this is, you know, I went back and just got on Discogs, educated myself about the entire story of RNS, and um, 
to me, I just tried to pick out elements that, that resonated with me. And uh, also this is an interesting time because dubstep was now not a London thing. It was a global thing. It was blown up in the States. Um, and it started to be awkward to be associated with dubstep because it mean it started to mean very different things for very different people. Um, so um, a lot of producers that were there from maybe not the not the first wave, but uh, you know the second wave of of dubstep producers, they started to write at slower BPMs, like almost to more. Uh, so going from 140 beats per minute down to 130, down to more house tempos, just to get a bit of distance away from um, the dubstep that was not uh, sharing the values of uh, uh, you know the original record. So this this is somewhere in the middle, I think. Right, I'm just going to skip a bit of the intro because it's quite long. that record is the beginning of how you became an accidental techno hero <laughs> um oh i don't know i mean it was just it was it was really strange that uh, the the crossover if you like from people that are associated with dubstep or post dubstep or you know all these words and descriptors started to to come in and uh, and stigmas and uh, I mean, it was annoying, you know, it was annoying. I mean, it was, it's, it's the same bunch of people um, who are all influencing each other. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the BPMs dropped and there started to be um, a real cross-pollination between uh, post-dubstep, let's call it that, uh, and UK Funky. So UK Funky was a sound that came through forward again and it was um, house tempo. Um, it, it, there was a, a phrase that was banded around at the time called uh, feminine pressure. So, uh, so if, if, you, if people thought, you know, that DMZ was just a bunch of kind of uh, bros in hoodies, uh, kind of not, uh, you know, I can just attest that out. was not true. Well, no, of course, no. But uh, uh, th this was basically funky was great because it made just everyone dance. And uh, yeah, it just it really changed the atmosphere. Uh, and, you know, all the post dubstep guys, we were the beats we were blown away by, you know, the beats. It has that kind of uh, almost soaker kind of uh, swing to it. So um, that started to come in and it just had a massive, massive influence. And that, I think, is one of the main reasons that the BPMs dropped. As soon as the BPMs dropped, uh, house and techno people started playing, let's say, our music or music from th from this scene. So we get this this mesh between uh, worlds, you know. And then you get interesting things like, uh, you know, you'd be playing in Bergheim, um, you know, w one week and then forward, 
uh, you know, on, on the Thursday before that. So incredible clash of like cultures um, happening um, because of it. But I think a lot of that is to do with um, with funky. So what happens when you kind of get adopted by another? You know, scene is a kind of problematic word sometimes, but let's use it just for kind of ease. What happens when you get adopted by a world that you're not necessarily part of? Yeah, it's a good learning process, you know. I mean, yeah, the, the obvious one is people call you a bandwagon jumper and um, uh, and what have you. But um, you know, I mean, I I know and I I know that lots of people that made the shift. You know, it was just a continuation of that exploration um, of uh, of different sounds. And then you know, uh, I started educating myself about you know Detroit, Chicago, and you realise there's just this whole world of music out there that you hadn't heard before so that starts coming in um just out of interest was there anyone when you did your kind of discovering of chicago house and detroit techno that it became your instant favorite like stuff that you really really hit you straight away well it's pretty obvious that drex here is um is the one but um but um yeah well let's say that rather than going off <laughs> okay so drex here um i guess we should have a little spin then of motion the dance shouldn't we Um, yeah, so this is a track that I wrote uh, in, um, I think I wrote it end of 2011, 2000, it came out in 2012, uh, and uh, it was the longest thing I did. I mean, most dubstep records, they're five minutes long, this one's like uh, seven and a half. Uh, and what I wanted to do with this track is just uh, present a journey, like uh, going back to sort of 91, 92 with the old hardcore records. Um, there used to be uh, about three or four different sections, sometimes 10 sections of a track. They would just wind around and, and you know, these people were writing on samplers that had like four seconds of memory or something. So I don't know how they did it, but um, I was like, well, m not many tracks do that at the moment. Not many tracks present more than one, uh, for idea, you know, or they, they just do one thing and they, they, they run with it. So this is me kind of trying to get back to some of that windy wormhole uh, aspects of, of hardcore, you know, but uh, it's got a 4-4 behind it. So, yeah, I'm jumping the bandwagon into techno. Um, I'm going to skip the, uh, uh, the intro to this track, so bear with me.
I, I wish more people would do that kind of bandwagon jumping. <laughs> so we've kind of, uh, we're moving forward, which means we've kind of moved past a point where we can talk about change in a dynamic environment. But, you know, this is the conversation we're having and we can't talk about everything. So can we kind of come right up to now or nearly now and um, talk about Black Light Spiral, and particularly sing a love song? Um, okay, so this uh, was one of the first tracks I wrote for my album that's come out uh, uh, earlier this year on on Hemlock and Black Light Spiral. Um, th uh, this track I'm going to play here is not one on the album. Um, it's like a VIP version I've done uh, that that with uh, that has like a, a longer sample than the main. Uh, the main loop. Um, so I'm just going to skip through to the beats. But I think this was the track off the album that most people chatted about, you know, or, or, or said to me that, you know, that they're into it. Uh, and it was just so much fun to write. Like the whole album was written in about two weeks, um, and w which is very quick for me. Usually, I, you know, I was taking up to three weeks or something to, to uh, you know, uh, write to tune, uh, break out the stems, mix it down and for th for this uh album uh something kind of something quite weird happened like i wrote uh and th th this tune and i played it out in a club uh and it sounded um, absolutely fucking awful uh there was no bass uh it basically folded the system uh and uh it was a packed club i think it was um corsica studio so it's like it's a function one sound system uh, but there was an interesting dynamic in the room that happened. Uh, it's a kind of a sense, people sort of looked around at each other like, what's going wrong? You know, what's, uh, you know, is the sound system broken? Is the, and to me that created quite a nice atmosphere. Like there was, uh, there was an uncertainty there that to me was exciting. Um, and that then inspired me to kind of, uh, right in this style, which is screw the mix downs, just try and get a reaction, try and get something that sounds strange in a club uh, um, that, that may, you know, right that, you know, there's uh, in, in production forums you, uh, uh, and if coming from drum and bass and dubstep, there are certain rules um, production wise that you tend to stick to, you know, your sub bass has to be around the same frequency area it can't go too low or otherwise it won't reproduce on a sound system and for this album i just thought well no s screw it let's just go what feels right with, with the gut doesn't matter what it looks like on a spectrum analyzer or anything let's just uh have a load of fun uh, writing tracks so that's why stuff like this came out so quickly and the whole in fact the whole record sounds brutalized frayed heavy hot uh, it's like completely different to anything else that you've done and, and it, it sort of sits aside in a it's funny because we often as art, well, artists seem to make music that progresses from a to b but this just seems like it sits somewhere completely removed from everything else you've done i mean the first track is just five minutes of sirens and like <laughs> yeah. and, and some other, you know a little bit of stuff going on in the background you're kind of waiting for that to just be the beginning but that's that's the whole thing that's the entirety yeah i mean it's so i was uh i guess you know writing for a few years and and, and in interview questions, the standard one is, when's your album going to come out, you know? And um, it, it's quite it, it's quite daunting. But, uh, you know, as soon as I had a, a, couple, uh, a couple of these tracks that were sounding very different to me, it just kind of, it, it fell together. And, the you know, the uh, one track informed another. Um, but, uh, yeah, you I were, mean, I you was... You were battling yourself. <laughs> yeah, you know, and the distortion... I mean, I was listening to, uh, you know, I was sort of, play I was playing in uh, like uh, clubs in Germany a lot and actually getting into, uh, you know, learning about 90s kind of uh, techno like Regis and downwards and all that sound and really kind of getting into uh, distortion. So the whole record is sort of put through, you know, l lots and lots of processes of uh, of distortion and uh, reverberation and delay. And yeah, I just wanted it to be quite disorienting, I guess. But um, anyway, here it is. <laughs>
I, I think it was uh, Mike Paradinas, uh, with, you know, Yuzik was saying to me, uh, that's the eating a lobster tune. <laughs> <laughs> What did someone say to me last night? They misheard it as well. They said something like, uh, oh, it sounded like full physicality or something. It, like it, it can, one of those things that you can make it sound like what you want it to sound like. Um, so, I think one thing that we should really talk about is uh, the thing you've been doing more recently with modular synths. Um, you did something called the modular review with the London modular. Try and get the word modular in that sentence a few more times. <laughs> um, I, I thought the interesting thing maybe to ask might be, I think a lot of people are interested in modular synths, but it's a kind of world that's quite far away from a lot of people. It's like you don't really know where you start or how you would get there, or there's quite a kind of a, a gap of access, information, money, all those other things. Can you just talk us through how you kind of got from being interested in it to kind of having a rig? Um, yeah, so after writing uh, Black Light Spiral, which was done all on computer, um, I uh, m moved, that was written uh, in my flat in London, and you know, I had a, a small kind of basic bedroom type setup. Uh, and uh, I, I moved out of London kind of soon after um, writing that and uh, finally have space to actually have some gear. and. Uh, I can't remember the exact thing that sort of got me into modular, but um, I just, uh, you know, I just, I just wanted it. Just looks so much fun. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, there is a huge learning curve. Um, but uh, I mean, modular. I started going to the London uh, modular uh, shop, um, which is London. It's well recommended, and um, you can just try stuff out. Um, I mean, if people were uh, James's lecture down there. You would have seen the rig. I mean, I won't, I, I won't explain it again. But basically, it's like a synthesizer, but you're buying, uh, you're, you're uh, putting together each component uh, separately and linking them together with wires. Uh, and the components that you can buy range from um, oscillators, um, so you know, traditional synthesis components right through to stuff that only exists or is only available uh, in a modular format. Um, and what were you, what did you gravitate towards first? Uh, so the first stuff that I bought was, um, I tried to, uh, I guess, build a synthesizer using it. So uh, one of the uh, computer VST or synthesizers that I used uh, a lot up until this point, so all of uh, Stop What You're Doing, the Anaconda, that was all written on uh, Native Instruments uh, Massive. And that has that's a wavetable synth, and it has a very particular sound. It's got a very cold, almost like a FM kind of, you know, rubbery, um, you know, metallic kind of sound. And uh, there was a, a module called Braids, which um, has a similar type of wavetable synthesis. Um, however, the cool thing about modular is that uh, you can plug anything into anything and it won't break. Um, so, uh, you know, it's just uh, control voltages, you know, it's like um, 5 or 12 volts. Um, you're passing stuff one into the other, but um, you can have one thing doing absolutely crazy things to another module, you know, um, and it can get very, very confusing. And, uh, you know, you've, you, you know, might have seen the, the, all these spaghetti wires coming out, but that's part of the charm, really. It's just kind of, you know, uh, you you get sounds through experimentation and just, you know, having fun um, that you just, it's not as natural for me, at least, to, to happen on the computers. So you started buying some stuff and then you started selling some stuff and finessing what you had. Yes, yeah, so, so modules are pretty expensive. Um, it's an expensive hobby to have. And I think one of the dangers of it is there's, there's so many um, options from so many manufacturers uh, and it's very much like a uh, once you get something uh, together, like a, like a patch, you think, oh, but only if I had this one, then I could make, you know, and you just end up in going around uh, in, in circles a bit and you end up with a with a rig. Um, so so like your your synth that can do many, many things. And that for me was a bit of a problem. It got too confusing. So I made the choice to take away all the things that 
produce sound. So um, I sold all the oscillators and I concentrated uh, just on uh, things that control sound. Uh, and there was one, th one there's a particular set of modules that really kind of blew my mind. And these are chaotic uh, modules. And it's, it's a bit daunting for me to actually try to explain this, but uh, it's based on chaos theory. Um, <sighs> for me, uh, chaos is very similar to randomness, but not quite. Um, the way that I visualize it, is uh, randomness is like the black and white fuzz on uh, a broken TV, whereas uh, chaotic noise, um, it's to do um, with, uh, it's like having a set of initial conditions um, and they will turn into something that's almost random, but there will be things that repeat uh, and, uh, you, you know, once you get that in a modular environment and start using the chaotic signals to uh, modulate or control melody or uh, ve velocity from your synthesizers, you can get some pretty wild stuff. And uh, I, after um, I wrote Blacklight Spiral, I um, very quickly wrote uh, another release which I gave as uh, it was a free download, but also um, a USB box set. So it's like an hour and 10 minutes long um, of just stuff that was all made on about three modules. Uh, I mean, the thing that, you know, that I haven't sort of told anyone, but um, I mean, it's the modules making this music. Uh, the setup was me setting up some initial conditions, um, plugging them into the computer, um, and hitting record, and then sometimes just going out, you know, <laughs> have like recording something for an hour, and I would come back, and you know, there was ten minutes or so uh, in each of the recordings that I thought was very interesting. Um, so I'm gonna um, play, uh, say, the second track in this, which has got some uh, some quite a lot of melody in it, and that's the chaos talking it's it's not me writing in these melodies you know so it's, i find it pretty wild as a concept and i do not understand it <laughs> <laughs> mm. so i'm just skipping to it now mm. Thank you. 
So you can kind of hear that like there is uh, like a randomness there, but there are certain phrases that, you know, repeat. So, you know, those chords that you were hearing wasn't me. Um, I've been in contact with the guy that uh, makes these two uh, particular modules. The one's called Chaos Bro. It's a good name. And uh, the other is Dreamboat. It's by Snazzy FX. And uh, he's an interesting, uh, I mean, a lot of the people that make these synthesizers are pretty wild characters. Um, but um, he's convinced that uh, it's, well, in his own words, they are sentient angels in chaos making music for you. And when they are in a good mood, they will give you music. I mean, <laughs> what, okay, dude. <laughs> but for you, when this happens, what does that do to your idea of what's possible? And where might this kind of thing that you've fallen into take you? Yeah, I mean, I think this is what's exciting for me. I mean, you know, as as you've heard, like there's a in my music, like over these five years, there's a lot of sound. There's a lot of different kind of sounds in there. So, I mean, I I think I've got that's what's exciting for me now. Is it's like I could spend twenty years learning, getting to the bottom of this, or never. But um, you know, and just using chaos and uh, to control various synths you know it's all done through midi that's the the, the language that's the inter the thing it interfaces with i mean there's other options that you can do but that's the one that i use so i'm just going to plug it into a bunch of stuff and, and see what comes out but i mean i i think i will uh so echo, echo in the valley is just literally me stepping back and letting uh, the modules do the talking. I think what I'll do next is try experimenting with me writing melody and then applying chaos to that. So try and, you know, try and meet them in the middle. Go flying with the angels, man. <laughs> so one more thing I wanted to ask you before we put it out to you guys. We've only got time for maybe three or four questions. So try and keep them kind of, you know, snap here, if possible. Um, so the last thing I wanted to ask you was... Um, Something you said to me last night after you played that you think this year has been a really vintage year for music. And I wondered what you think is so good about now. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I've, you know, like I mentioned before, I've unsubscribed from all the crap and now I just go out and buy 12 inch records and play 12 inch records. And I've brought some wicked records this year from all over. Um, and uh yeah it, it, to me it doesn't seem as though like there's so many cities that are popping up you know that, that are popping off and have their local scenes and are, uh, are influencing each other um and i don't know what it is it's like it feels as though ever since uh post dubstep was post dubstep there's been another you know uh phase and it's been this other phase and another phase and another phase and nothing the last uh, solid ground if you like or a solid scene uh w was dubstep and we've just kind of been floating around try you know you know trying to get our heads around it for for, for almost five years now and um you know it's uh I, I've, I've kind of just given up trying to trying to you know understand or define uh what the good records are and just go and go with my gut. But um, something's working, you know, it's uh, I can't see anything now with the way that uh, everyone is interacting online. I can't see another scene happening in a local town that doesn't just instantly blow up, you know, uh, or that has time to gestate on its own in the lo localized before becoming a global thing before everyone hears it. So um, yeah, I mean, I can. I, th I think it's going to continue like that, but it's working. Maybe it's time for a, a blackout. <laughs> if you've got something good, don't tell anyone about it. <laughs> okay, then. So, microphone questions. Hi. 
Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. And uh, I once saw this documentary, Living Inside the Speaker, and I don't remember who, but he said that dubstep by that time was like a, the, a Swiss Army knife uh, of genres, right? And I don't know, I, I want to uh, know your thoughts about how um, culture can mesh with with this. I don't know what's the science be behind the magic of dubstep related sounds, but uh, that track Anaconda you made, uh, uh, once I heard this uh, really cool mi remix, I think it's Double Dutch, but it released anonymously, uh, it's a Tribal yeah. Guarachero edit, and it's you being remix. And I also, you made this remix for the XX, Island, so I don't know how. Uh, how what are your thoughts in, in, in how can you merge with other genres, even if it's like pop music or, or extremely like local genres in, all, in the other side of the world? Yeah, I mean, um, I think you know, dubstep and drum and bass, you know, my, my two musical touch points, it was there's very f uh, few rules, few ground, you know, usually it's tempo and bass um so that you know that to me uh is all that it needs to be for it to be a dubstep record or certainly that's how it felt then so um so yeah with that it's a blank canvas you know so it just naturally uh lends itself to meshing with other scenes and stuff but yeah bass bass and beats <laughs> okay thank you Um, I just have felt like I noticed this phenomenon more recently where a lot of noise artists have started to incorporate beats into their set. Um, and I think noise, although noise has been like one of the main ingredients of techno f since the beginning, um, I was just wondering if there's any noise artists that influence you or if, if it's the beat driven stuff or the club stuff that's the only do you have like a, a different connection to noise or experimental music yeah so it's so I, I said before you know i'm a clueless idiot when it comes to music history so i'm doing lots and lots of learning um but i'm really identifying with people like pete swanson and yeah like you say there's a very interesting for me, the least the least interesting aspect of noise is the full on face melting blast of of kind of a, of white noise. I, uh -huh. To me, when it has more angles, at least um, that's how I identify with it. But I really like this strange middle ground at the moment uh, between noise. You know, is it is it a techno track? Is it is it noise? Is it is it something else? You know, so. Yeah, definitely. But, you know, Pete Swanson, I, I, I'm rating. Cool. Is that a question at the back there? Or is that just a stretch? <laughs> okay, then, in which case, we should just say a very, very big thank you, Untold. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>